I've been given 10 minutes to talk about common breast symptoms, um, and clearly that's not something that, is there a, is it just a mouse? Yeah, that can be done in a space of 10 minutes. So we'll con just concentrate on the four main ones, which are pain, nipple inversion, crusting, and discharge. Um, so looking at mastalgia, this is a symptom that's very common. 70% of women will experience some form of breast pain at some point in their life. And the take-home <laughs> message from, for your patients once you've ruled out malignancy um, is that breast cancer is generally painless because that's what they come to you wondering, have I got a breast cancer? So what should you do in your primary practice if you see a patient with mastalgia? I cannot stress the importance enough of a good history and exam. And of course, if there's a focal abnormality, that is a discrete mass, um, or nipple discharge, for example, that is um, of a significant type, then they do re require referral to breast clinic. However, the majority of patients with mastalgia have got typical symptoms, be that cyclical or non-cyclical, and a normal examination. And if they fit into the under breast screen um, age group, then you can just generally reassure them and put in place general measures for the management of mastalgia. And that starts off with making sure that they're wearing the right bra cup size um, for them. And believe me, most women are not wearing the right bra size. <laughs> so send them along, um, encourage them to go for a fitting, um, look at analgesia, simple measures, paracetamol, um, non or gels, dietary change, coffee, cutting down on your coffee consumption, fat, fat, fat um, changes in your diet, um, not greatly proven, but might be helpful. Um, and sometimes they've had recent medications added which have um, created the issues with, um, with increased nostalgia. So tweaking those might help. And the other thing is not all breast pain is due to the breast. So there are lots of other structures in the area. So please do c give consideration when you hear something slightly atypical to cardiac causes and other musculoskeletal causes, particularly costochondritis and manage those if that is what the actual cause is. Now, if nostalgia has persisted for three or more cycles, and despite all your best intentions, um, the patient's still su suffering severely, and by severe, I mean it wakes them at night, um, or it significantly interferes with their ability to carry on with their daily life activities, then consider giving them danazole or tamoxifen. But these are medications not to be used lightly because they do have significant side effects. Now, if they're in the breast screening age or they have atypical symptoms, say they've got a lump that comes and goes, or a significant family history that fits them into the moderate risk group or the high risk group, then this is your opportunity to make sure that their screening mammogram is up to date. And of course, if that's normal, then reassure them, give them general measures and perhaps some evening primrose oil. And if it's abnormal, of course, they'll come through to breast clinic for assessment. I thought I'd touch on evening primrose oil because it's a mainstay part of managing mastalgia. Um, the cause behind mastalgia is ma multifactorial. Um, a proportion of that is thought to be due to fatty acid imbalance in the breast. And evening primrose oil is a plant-based product that contains 7 to 14% gamma linolenic acid and thought to correct some of that imbalance. It needs to be taken over three months, so three cycles, and it's done in a dose reduction fashion. Um, and if it has helped that woman, then she can choose to continue taking it at a low rate of one capsule a day for as long as she needs to for her symptom control, and she can stop it when she feels like it too. Severe mastalgia treatments include danazole, which is a testosterone analogue, and tamoxifen, which on the uterus is an agonist, on the breast is an antagonist to oestrogen. Now, these medications have got significant side effects, um, and hence use them with judiciously, if you like. Um, so in summary for mas mastalgia, none of these treatments have good, strong RCT or meta-analysis evidence. Most of these women are coming to you because they want reassurance it's not a malignancy. Now, those of us in private, when we are referred someone under 40, we would get some form of imaging. An ultrasound usually in the under 40s, 40 to 45, would usually get an ultrasound and a mammogram. But in the public system, there are resource constraints, and we, there is no significant risk of missing a cancer, uh, which is why the public system has divided it the way I showed you um, on, the, on, on um, the pathway before. Um, general measures are usually sufficient for most of these patients. 
Um, and please, if there are focal findings or abnormal image findings, of course we want to see them. But I hope this equips you to manage those without the, uh, those sorts of findings in the community. Nipple inversion. Sorry, I'm moving rather quickly through this. So nipple inversion also affects women, um, about 20% of women. And much as when we hear nipple inversion, the first word that comes to mind is all cancer. It's more likely that they'll have a benign cause for their nipple inversion than a cancer. So congenital causes, previous mastitis, granulomatous mastitis, surgery, radiotherapy, idiopathic <coughs> causes will all surpass cancer. But it is important to have cancer at the back of your mind when you see someone with nipple inversion. So what do you do in your practice when, they come through, when a patient comes through to you with nipple inversion? Have a look at them, history and examination as always. Now, if it is persistent, it's unilateral, it's new, or there's a focal abnormality associated with it, yes, we do want to see them. However, if the patient has a normal examination, the nipple actually is slightly flat, but everts normally and stays out, and there is no focal breast abnormality, and they're under the breast screen age, then reassure them and encourage them um, along the pathway to smoking cessation, because ductectasia or floppy ducts can also lead to some degree of, um, of uh, nipple inversion, and that's more common in smokers. Those in the over, in, in the breast screen category, again, it's an opportunity to update their screening. And if it's normal, same thing, reassurance. If it's abnormal, of course, they'll come through to breast clinic. So for nipple inversion, the most important bits are that is it new, is it persistent, is it unilateral, and do they have anything in terms of a focal abnormality or abnormal screening? Those are the ones that should be referred. Looking at crusting, so this is Paget's. Um, Paget's, you can see the nipple's almost destroyed. It's flat. It's not a thickened area like this one here. And then it's moved on to involve the areola here. This is dermatitis. It's focal, mainly areola, and it's a thick patch that sometimes is scaly. When it's really severe, yes, it can involve the nipple as well. So in general, dermatitis affects the younger patient, is mainly areola patches, it's itchy um, as compared to Paget's, uh, which affects the older patient. It's not itchy. And the dermatitis affects the areola to start with, often in little patches. Now, take a little bit more of a history in depth and ask them, you know, do they have eczema elsewhere? Often they'll have a past history or present history of other spots of dermatitis. Um, and dermatitis can often be bilateral as well, where Paget's is usually unilateral. And the nipple discharge, so often we get referrals where people say, oh, they've got the scaly patch and they've nipple discharge. And when you ask the patient very carefully, where is your discharge from? They say, oh, that scaly patch, when it's really bad, it puts out a bit of fluid. Um, and when you ask them specifically, do you get fluid out of the little holes on your nipple? No, they don't. So take a detailed history. Um, Paget's tends to be associated with the duct system and hence that some of them may have nipple discharge, not all. So what should you do? Again, history and examination. But um, if it is unilateral, predominantly nipple-based, an older patient, or they have a focal abnormality, then please refer them on. If you have a normal breast exam, you've got a younger patient, and it's a focal, predominantly areola patch, then divide them into their pre-screening, post-screening groups. So the younger patient, Try and treat their dermatitis. Um, and that involves giving them soap substitutes, um, bar, uh, solutions for the bath, antibiotics if, they are, um, if they've got a super infection. And the, when they're in their really bad patch for that first week or so, get them to put a little bit of steroid, dermol or 1% hydrocort on the area at night and then slop on a big dollop of a good emollient, not aqueous cream, but something stronger. Sorbolene is usually the best one. Big dollop on, breast pad, breastfeeding pad, and, um, and a bra on at night, and do that for a week. It will settle down. Once it's settled down, it's important to stop the steroid because that just thins the skin and makes it more dry after that. But it's also equally important that they continue on with the emollient as a general moisturizer to prevent them from getting severe episodes again and again. 
If they're in the breast screening age group, it's a great um, opportunity to ensure that their screening is up to date. And if that's normal, again, try and treat their dermatitis. If it's abnormal, of course, they're going to come through to clinic. Now, sometimes, despite your best efforts and your patient's best efforts, there's still some persistent unilateral scaly patches. And if you're not sure what it is, get a punch biopsy. Now, if you have the skill and the ability to do this, please do this at your practice. Um, at, because clearly, otherwise, we get overloaded, overloaded mainly with dermatitis cases. And this is where the nor exam is normal, and they're young, and it's focal areola stuff. Um, if that punch biopsy comes back as pagets, we'd love to see them. If the punch biopsy comes back as dermatitis and the patient is still struggling with their dermatitis despite your best efforts, then dermatology is where to send them, not us. Um, so in summary, the worrisome crusting is older, unilateral. It is not itchy. It predominantly is on the nipple area. They may have other focal abnormalities, or if you've done a punch, an abnormal punch biopsy result or an abnormal screening result. Those are the ones to refer through to clinic. Nipple discharge. So again, most nipple discharge is benign. Um, the worrisome ones are papillomas, ADH, and DCIS. So again, history and examination. If they're getting bilateral discharge and it's clear, think about doing some thyroid function tests. If they're getting milky discharge, think about doing a prolactin level. The ones to worry about, they're spontaneous, they're unilateral, they're often from one little duct. They are clear or bloodstained in color, so serous or bloodstained. They're reproducible, and they may or may not have associated focal abnormalities, um, such as a breast lump with it. Those ones need to be referred. The majority of nipple discharge is benign, and they often have lots of little ducts that are producing um, green-yellow discharge. It might be one side, it might be both sides quite commonly, on expressing, and often they're smokers. This is duct ectasia. <laughs> and um, the idea is to get a screening, um, a screening imaging done if they are over, 40, uh, over 44. If that's abnormal, they come through to breast clinic. If it's normal, then reassure them, but please ask them not to express. Es expressing only produces serous discharge from irritation or blood um, from the trauma. Ask them to stop smoking. Review them in three months. And if there's no discharge or they've still got benign sounding discharge, you've ruled out malignancy by doing their screening, they're not troubled by it and there are no red flags, then reassure them. If they're still getting benign discharge, but it's persistent, it's problematic, it's smelly, it's interfering with their daily life, and it's spontaneous, then please refer them to, through because they may qualify for duct excision. So in summary, spontaneous, one side, clear bloody discharge, focal abnormality or abnormal screening, those are the ones to refer through. So hopefully in this rapid run through, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I hope that you've, you're in a position where you've got better balance in terms of being able to manage the majority of these in primary care, but also being able to identify those with red flags early so you can refer them through to breast clinic, but because we would like to see those ones for these four conditions. Now, just a last note, at CMDHB, we're probably the strictest on these criteria at the moment, and that's because we have significant resource constraints. So remember that every patient that we see with a common breast symptom who doesn't have a red flag has just taken the spot of a patient with breast cancer of yours. Okay.